St. Patrick's Day, New York. 40 million Americans claim Irish descent, and today's the day when they march through the city, celebrating their roots and showing off their achievement as one of the largest and richest communities in the United States. Some of these people are the descendants of Irish immigrants who first came here 150 years ago, hungry and in rags. Today, their descendants are so successful that members of many other communities are happy to be Irish for the day. But among the throng of people having a good time are a few who harbour bitter memories of exile and pain, of British injustice and oppression back in the old country. Many of those memories begin with the terrible events of the Great Famine. The London Times wrote, they are going, they are going with the vengeance. The Celts are going. Pretty soon a Celt on the streets of Dublin will be as rare as an Indian on the streets of Manhattan. This is something that England can never let down. They allowed these people to die by the millions. They shipped them out of the country. Anything, get rid of them. The landlords even shipped them out. They, there were so many of them died, they had no place to bury them. The mound, you can still go and find a little field a little in, uh, in the countryside. They had bottoms in the casket so they could dress, drop them out. Children died at their mother's breast, and who cared? A hundred and fifty years ago, Ireland's potato crop, the staple diet of millions of people, was destroyed by blight. In the years of famine which followed, a million men, women and children died of starvation and disease. The people cried out for food, but the British government, which ruled all Ireland at the time, was miserly and slow with famine relief, and determined to protect the rights of property and profit, whatever the cost in human suffering. Death is in every hovel. Disease and famine have fastened on the young and old, the mother and the infant. You'd have to have a heart of stone not to feel compassion for the Irish peasants when the famine struck. Life was always very difficult for them. Their religion was reviled, their native language and culture despised. There was always the possibility of eviction and then came the potato blight. It looked like the end of the road, but for some of the lucky ones, there was one last resort, emigration. The richer tenant farmers were often the first to go. The obvious strength of the country is departing. It's the industrious and enterprising who are leaving us. Let me go to the land of liberty. Let me see no more of the tithe man and tax man. Poorer people soon followed. In place of starvation, America offered hopes of prosperity and full bellies. Sorrow at leaving home came second to the need to survive. Despite the pain of separation and fears of life in a strange land, emigration seemed the only hope. For just a few pence, it was possible to get a passage on one of the new steamships which plied across the Irish Sea to ports in Scotland, Wales and England. Three hundred thousand people came to Liverpool in 1847 alone. The first immigrants who came perhaps were the better off ones, but increasingly as the famine bit, the emigrants were poorer. A lot of them were ridden, um, had fever, and they were obviously not welcome because they were a burden on the local taxpayers. And unfortunately, 1847, there was a recession in England. 
So it actually coincided with a period of high unemployment in Britain. And who are these paupers coming from Ireland expecting poor relief? So the sympathy, public sympathy, turned very quickly to wanting to get rid of the problem. It was seen as a problem. And what is interesting is the port authorities in Liverpool and Glasgow, Cardiff, elsewhere, repeatedly asked the government to control the problem, to introduce some sort of fever legislation, to do something, and the government said they could not intervene. Despite British hostility, hundreds of thousands of poor Irish people stayed on, joining earlier generations of immigrants in the overcrowded slums. Many died of fever, but many more survived. And within five years of the famine, there were three quarters of a million Irish-born people in mainland Britain. But for well over a million Irish emigrants, Britain wasn't far enough. They were determined to go to America. And in the spring of 1847, this old key in Cork was thronged with thousands of people desperate to get away. America was the favourite destination, but passage to Canada was cheaper, and in 1847 almost 100,000 people opted for British North America. Many passengers were already infected with fever. They were supposed to undergo a medical inspection, but there were too few doctors for the multitude of emigrants. Everywhere there was panic and confusion. They're running away from fever, disease and hunger with money scarcely sufficient to pay passage for and find food for the voyage. When they eventually got on board, it must have seemed that the worst was over. A Quaker who witnessed peasants embarking for America wrote in his diary, there was nothing but joy at their escape as if from a doomed land. God help them, they didn't know what horrors awaited them once they set sail. The departure itself was often jubilant, with people thronging the decks to say goodbye. Even the congested hold must have seemed exciting at first, but within a few days the appalling overcrowding made itself felt. Hundreds of poor people, men, women and children of all ages, from the driveling idiot of 90 to the babe just born, huddled together, without light, without air, wallowing in filth and breathing a fetid atmosphere, sick in body, dispirited in heart, living without food or medicine, except as administered by the hand of casual charity, dying without spiritual consolation. Typhus, spread by body lice, ran amuck among the passengers stacked in the bunks, sometimes there were four or five to one bunk. And then, of course, there was dysentery caused by the total lack of sanitation. This, this was the toilet. When the weather was bad, the passengers were battened down, the hatches were closed, and sometimes they were on the deck for a few days or even, even for a few weeks. One need not think too hard to imagine the horror of those days. It was a sort of hell, a hell at sea, if not a hell on earth. The voyage could take anything from six weeks to three months. Some ships were old coasters and timber vessels brought into the trade by greedy speculators. Others were well built and well supplied, but conditions on board were still extremely harsh. The desire to reach America being extremely strong, many of the emigrants were content to submit to very great hardships during the voyage. We were all seasick, not a man on board was free. We were all confined unto our bones, and no one to pity poor me. No father kind, nor mother dear, to lift up my head. Which made me think more 
of the lassie I left on Paddy's green sham of shore. For far too many of the Irish emigrants, the first landfall was Gros Isle, the quarantine station for Quebec, where all vessels with fever on board were obliged to stop. Sick passengers had to be landed on the island, where they would have to stay until they died or had been declared free of infection. The regulations were strictly enforced, but in 1847, many of the ships at anchor under the guns were carrying the bodies of people who'd already died at sea. There was a continuous line of boats, each carrying its freight of dead to the burial ground and forming an endless funeral procession. From one ship, a boat proceeded four times during the course of the day, each time laden with a cargo of dead. The main cause of the death, of course, was the disease. And uh, you had good captains, you had bad captains, you had good ships, you had bad ships. And you had ships that provided good food and some that provided uh, not so good food. But basically, if the, if the immigrants were healthy when they boarded the ships, they could survive. And uh, it was so, the, the, the high death rates came, of course, on ships where you had fever breaking out. Uh, and, of course, the fever was the main cause of death. With thousands of sick and dying people to cope with, conditions on the pretty island soon became atrocious. The medical superintendent, Dr. Douglas, pleaded for money for new hospital buildings to replace the overcrowded fever sheds. These were very miserable, so slightly built as to exclude neither the heat nor the cold. I have known poor families prefer to burrow under heaps of stone on the shore rather than accept the shelter of the infected sheds. In this building behind us, apparently there were, there were double-decker bunks, and um, one can picture the various accidents that occur when you're sick and, and the poor people in the lower bunks suffering from somebody's misery above. So there's, there are conditions, the, the overcrowding, the numbers of people, it's bad enough if one person is or one family is enduring uh, misery and sickness and the death, but when you're surrounded by, by it, uh, the doctors and those in who still had, the priests who still had some elements of, of, of strength and, and health about them, they themselves must have suffered from watching the terrible conditions under which people existed. Douglas at one point says that the things are so bad that he has to put two in a bed and that uh, he quotes at one point, these people are so indifferent to life that they'll even lie alongside a corpse without, without any emotion or without, without showing any, any signs of, of fear or revulsion. They're, they've been reduced to such a terrible condition. 5,400 Irish people are said to be buried on Gros Isle. Some historians believe there are many more. Those who escaped quarantine often took fever with them as they fled up the rivers. Many thousands more were to die before the survivors found refuge in the countryside or crossed the border into the United States. Altogether, something approaching one-fifth, up to 20,000 of the 1847 immigrants to Canada, died before they could complete their journey. A few joined relatives in the countryside where they could find work on the land. Others were too poor or sick to travel and stayed in the slums of the ports where they'd landed, like St. John, New Brunswick, where an Irish quarter quickly developed down by the Keys. Some immigrants began to regret that they'd ever come. This place is different from our opinions at home, bad and all as we were in Ireland. I often wished we'd never seen St. John. The quarantine station for St. John was Partridge Island, 
the local authorities resented being used as a dumping ground for Irish paupers. They landed in the greatest misery and destitution, so broken down and emaciated by starvation, disease, and the fatigues of the voyage as to be in great measure incapable of performing sufficient labor to earn a subsistence. One particular case, uh, the vessel Aeolus had made two voyages to St. John in 1847, um, brought approximately 1,000 immigrants in total. Uh, a large number of them were ill, and several hundred died from, from those two uh, voyages. And uh, I suppose the, the bubble burst for St. John uh, on that second voyage uh, at the end of the immigrant season in November, when Common Council actually passed a resolution asking for the government to basically send all these Irish back to Ireland. Um, we don't want them, we don't need them, we can't afford them. Uh, so let's get rid of them and send them back. To the government's credit, of course, uh, that didn't happen, and uh, they weren't sent back. The Eolus, the ship which brought so much misery and death to St. John, was carrying per tenants from Lord Palmerston's estate. The great British statesman was also an absentee Irish landlord. His lordship was anxious to clear his estate of unprofitable tenants, and his agents had paid for their transportation. Other landlords, like the Marquis of Sligo, behaved very generously at first. But as the financial burdens increased, they began to evict their tenants and turn them off their estates to seek such relief as they could find or starve by the roadside. This wholesale extermination of entire communities wasn't altogether the fault of the landlords. In 1847, the British government made Irish landlords responsible for the rates, the local taxes, of all their poor tenants. Many of the landlords were in debt, and their tenants were no longer paying any rent. Such landlords faced a stark choice, evict their tenants or go bankrupt themselves. To blame landlords for the famine is a, is a great oversimplification. It's uh, just, it will not wash. Uh, some landlords did what they could and, and crashed, uh, lost all they had, and others behaved uh, very cruelly. Uh, the ones who behaved badly, of course, uh, get written up, like uh, Lord Lucan, uh, Vandeleur in Kilrush, uh, Lord Sligo, um, and Lord Leitrim gets, uh, uh, gets mentioned as well. Uh, but um, the trouble is that about one-fifth or one-quarter of uh, landed property uh, changed hands because of people going bankrupt. Uh, and had landlords spent every penny they had, there still would have been a problem. So uh, uh, putting the burden on Irish landed property uh, in 1847 was not a feasible uh, way of uh, dealing with famine relief. The landlord's church, the Church of Ireland, was also blamed for exploiting the poor during the famine. Protestants were later persecuted in some areas, and their churches gradually fell into decay. The problem here was called superism, and it arose from the belief that some Anglican pastors forced Catholics to convert to Protestantism in exchange for food. You can still find memorials in some areas which keep alive the belief that Catholics preferred to die rather than take the soup. In enduring memory of the numerous heroes of West Clare who died rather than pervert in the Great Famine and who were buried here coffinless in three large pits. Taking the soup was seen as treachery by the Catholics. It was in Irish what was called cool akin. It was they were bending their own people as much as their faith. Um, yes, it is hard for us to understand it. I know there was a certain amount of persecution of the people who became converts. They were called supers, and that nickname super is, is still used around the country as an insult. As a synonym for somebody who betrays the cause? Yes, um, a traitor, um, uh, someone who, uh, an apostate, someone who abandoned the faith for the sake of soup. But um, I would say that at the same time that there were very few Protestant clergymen who um, would deny food to a Catholic unless he became Protestant. I think that would have happened very, very seldom if at all. 
In fact, charitable relief for the poor of both faiths was often distributed by Church of Ireland clergymen, and many of them became infected with typhus fever while visiting the sick. Dr. Trail of Skull did great work during the famine, and he was never accused of interfering in religion by the Catholics at all. Um, he is really a classic example of a Protestant clergyman who did heroic work during the famine and paid for it with his life. The problem was that a few years before the famine, a group of evangelical Protestants had started free schools for poor Catholic children in remote areas, giving away food along with dollops of the Bible. This enraged some Catholic clergy. It would be better to cut your children's throats with a knife than to send them to such schools. One such school was run by Edward Nangle, an evangelical Protestant, openly committed to converting Catholics, who started a mission to Akil Island before the famine began. He built a so-called colony in the village of Dugort, complete with a dispensary, an evangelical newspaper and a soup kitchen. Today, there are very few Protestants left on Akil, and some Catholics still believe that Nangle forced Catholics to change their faith by bribing them with soup. And then in ages dreary, Nangle bold apostle came to corrupt the sick and weary, soup and brachan to proclaim. Brachan is the, the it's soup. kind of a scotch broth. Uh, yeah. They made out of turnips and other things that boiled them in a big pot. And uh, you'd have to turn a Protestant to get any of Nangle's soup. He came like on a difficult mission to establish a Protestant community among a Catholic community. True or false, the great soup controversy served the Catholic Church well. Many Catholics whose faith had been lukewarm before the hunger began, turned to the church with renewed fervor after the famine, perhaps because some clergy encouraged the belief that the famine was a punishment for their sins. It is a calamity with which God wishes to purify the Irish people. In the years following the famine, the Catholic faith slowly became more and more identified with Irish nationalism. But in 1847, nationalism was at a low ebb. The great Daniel O'Connell, whose monster rallies against the union with Britain had once inspired thousands, died the same year on a pilgrimage to Rome. Now, nationalist politics were divided between supporters of O'Connell's son, John, and supporters of a new group of Irish militants called Young Ireland. One of them, Charles Gavin Duffy, became editor of their newspaper, The Nation, which grew increasingly radical as the famine continued its ravages. In 1848, inspired by revolutions all over Europe, the editors called for armed rebellion. A revolutionary social change has become indispensable. The last gaspings of a thousand, thousand human beings have commanded it. Smith O'Brien, himself a landlord from an old Irish family, reluctantly took responsibility for leading the armed rebellion. On July the 30th, 1848, he and another young islander, James Stevens, found themselves besieging this farmhouse in County Tipperary at the head of a rabble of half-starved men. A squad of the Royal Irish Constabulary had taken refuge behind the barricaded windows. The rebels outnumbered the police, but they were ill-armed and completely untrained. They took shelter behind the garden wall, firing their antiquated guns and hurling rocks at the windows. Smith O'Brien finally decided to set fire to some buildings at the back of the house to try and smoke the policemen out. But then the owner of the house, a certain Widow McCormack, arrived home to find a battle going on. She immediately told Smith O'Brien to stop the fighting, as five of her seven children were inside the house. O'Brien was not the man to ignore a mother's appeal. He called on his men to cease firing while he tried to persuade the police to surrender. At this moment of extreme tension, 
Smith O'Brien came around the corner here to the front of the house to negotiate with the police. He came to this window and stuck his arm over the barricade. Unfortunately, at that very moment, one of his men hurled a stone at the window and the police upstairs immediately opened fire and loosed a volley into the crowd of insurgents. The insurgents fled. It was the end of the Young Islanders war effort, but not of their idealism. Smith O'Brien borrowed the police inspector's horse and rode away. He was arrested at a railway station a few days later while trying to catch a train home. O'Brien was imprisoned, but James Stevens, who had later found the Irish Republican Brotherhood, escaped and joined the flood of refugees leaving the country. Ireland's long struggle for independence often sank into failure, even absurdity, but it always resurfaced and many of the young Ireland leaders eventually escaped from imprisonment and joined the great exodus across the Atlantic to the United States. This mass emigration, one and a half million people left Ireland between 1847 and 1851, was without doubt the single most important outcome of the Great Famine. For the hundreds of thousands of Irish emigrants who crossed the Atlantic in the mid-1800s, America was the great dream, the dream of freedom, the land of promise, the land of hope. And New York was the supreme goal, it was the Mecca. Most of the Irish who came here probably didn't know very much about America, but they did know one thing, and that one thing was very important. They knew that the Americans had got rid of the British, and that must have been a great attraction. The main point of entry for the famine immigrants was South Street Quay on Manhattan Island. There's never been anything like it in American history before this. The whole idea of us as an immigrant nation begins in this place, really, with the Irish immigrants who come through, because they're not just um, immigrants, they're essentially foreign to the people who were living here in New York. They're, they're Catholic, many of them don't speak English. Uh, and they are perceived as essentially foreign. The great debate in the United States about the reception of foreigners begins here. When they get off these boats and come down onto the ground, they find people waiting for them who uh, pose as people willing to help them. They were called runners, and they were taking their luggage. They would bring them to rooming houses, and the idea was to fleece them of everything they had before they got 100 yards into Manhattan. There were almost no government control of immigration at that time. So that they, were, they thought the end of their journey was, was here. In many ways, this was the beginning of it. This is a sanitized version of 19th century New York. You would have to imagine, you'd have the horse droppings in the street, you'd have privies overrunning, you'd have poor houses, you'd have taverns, you'd have hotels for sailors, jammed with people, a crowded, noisy, dirty place. And what sort of prejudices and exclusions did they find here? Well, they find that the whole country begins to organize. Their immigration is in such volume, and they're in such a um, disastrous condition, many of them, when they come here, that there's a whole, it's called a nativist movement in America to stop the Irish immigration into the United States. The largest third party political movement in American history is the Know Nothing Party, which is organized specifically to stop the Irish immigration into the United States. This feeling that with the country is being overwhelmed by this alien, group that will never be assimilated. The living conditions of the Irish poor in New York shocked Protestant Americans. We could tell of one room, 12 feet by 12, in which were five resident families. Their condition far exceeded the limit of all previously conceived ideas of human degradation and suffering. They could be turned out of their squalid lodgings with even less ceremony than an island. And for many years, the poor Irish were regarded as inherently dishonest, the most likely candidates for prison or the lunatic asylum. The American Civil War began the process of acceptance. Irish soldiers fought bravely on both sides, and the army made an ideal recruiting ground for the Fenians, a new movement founded by John O'Mahony, a former member of Young Ireland. In the late 1860s, the Fenians decided to launch a rebellion in Ireland itself. Once there, the Irish-American Civil War veterans must have looked pretty conspicuous. They were easily spotted by government spies, and many were soon rounded up and imprisoned. 
undeterred, their leader, Colonel Kelly, launched a nationwide insurrection on the night of March the 6th, 1867. Here in Temple Road in the leafy suburbs of South Dublin, about 500 Fenians gathered. It was dreadfully cold, it was snowing, it was very dark. And instead of moving on central Dublin, they went out beyond here to a place called Tala, and they were followed by the police, the army knew what was happening, and they were rounded up. About 200 prisoners were taken. It looked like a complete fiasco. But the heavy sentences handed out by the British courts had a great impact on Irish public opinion. People who previously hadn't shown any interest in the Fenians now threw their weight behind the Fenians and their cause. It was a new beginning. The movement really took off when a band of Fenians held up the prison van carrying Colonel Kelly to jail in Manchester. Unfortunately, in the course of the struggle, an unarmed police sergeant was shot dead. Several alleged Fenians were arrested and tried for murder. A lot of the evidence was flimsy, circumstantial, but three men, Allen, Larkin and O'Brien, were found guilty. Irish public opinion swung round on their side and turned them into heroes. When they were hanged, the three men became martyrs. They're still revered as martyrs. This memorial in Kilrush is one of several similar monuments in different parts of Ireland, where the sacrifices made by some of the early nationalists are proudly remembered. The story of the three men and their heroism is part of nationalist mythology. The power of that mythology, especially where the famine was concerned, was put to work by the son of an Ulster Presbyterian minister, John Mitchell. He was a former member of Young Ireland, an ardent nationalist, with a passionate hatred of the British. Mitchell was a master of the telling phrase of the carefully calculated exaggeration. One and a half million men, women and children were carefully, prudently and peacefully slain by the English government. The Almighty indeed sent the potato blight, but the English created the famine. Mitchell blamed everything on the British, relieving the Irish of any responsibility for their actions. And you can hear his words on the lips of Irish nationalists to this day. A government ship sailing into any harbour with Indian corn was sure to meet half a dozen sailing out with Irish wheat and cattle. In other words, Ireland had plenty of food, but it was all exported to England, so the Irish starved. But Mitchell was wrong. Exports of food continued because the government refused to interfere with free trade. But apart from a terrible few weeks at the beginning of the famine, far more grain flowed into Ireland than out of it. One of the, the stock folk images uh, of the famine is cartloads and uh, barge loads of grain uh, moving east. And uh, uh, of course, uh, grain continued to be exported during the famine. but far more grain was imported. I mean, the, the balance of trade in grain was uh, adverse and uh, very markedly so during the famine period. Uh, but of course, uh, the grain imported was of low quality. It tended to be uh, Indian meal or maize, whereas uh, what was exported was oats and, and wheat. Um, but the only period in which there would have been an excess of exports over imports would have been uh, at the very beginning in uh, late 46 and early 47 and that is because of course the maize uh, took a while to arrive from distant shores the pattern of emigration set up by the famine continued and mitchell himself eventually joined the throng of irish immigrants who went on pouring into the united states throughout the second half of the 19th century the later arrivals found a far warmer welcome than the famine emigrants, but many of them still felt that they'd been forced into exile by the hated British, and they took these beliefs with them to their new country. The liberating climate of the United States 
made many Irish immigrants all the more determined to back independence for the old country. America enabled them to see that freedom and democracy for Ireland was a real possibility. Some Irish Americans still seem to be more Irish than the Irish themselves. Caught in a kind of historical time warp, their anti-colonial attitudes frozen far back in the past. Even after 50 years in America, Paddy Reynolds still swears by John Mitchell's dictum that the English created the famine. I think that they contributed to the death of about four and a half million Irish men, women and children. And for that they should pay. Whatever way that is possible. They did contribute to it. And they did help to, to keep it going. What could they have done that they didn't do to alleviate the suffering? And they could the... have supplied us with the food that was necessary. The question that always enters my mind is the uh, potato crop allegedly failed, blight hit it. What happened to the wheat, oats, barley, rye, and other grain crops that was in the shipyards of Ireland, Dublin, and Belfast, and Sligo? on its way out to the Crimea to, to feed British troops while the people in Ireland were dying with starvation. They didn't even try to save their lives, they contrived it to do it. They allowed them to die. It was a complete genocide of the Irish people. Out in my mind, the British were mainly responsible. Ethnic cleansing of this century. If a native government had been in charge in Ireland, the people would not have starved. God's curse upon you, Lord John Russell. May your black heart and soul rot in hell. There's no love left on earth. God is dead in heaven and he's dark and deadly days of black boy silver. God's curse upon you, Lord truth about you. For a younger generation of Irish Americans, Larry Kerwin's passionate Black 47 punches home the message that the English were responsible. So it's hardly surprising that ever since the days of the famine, some Irish Americans have been willing to finance Irish nationalists in their struggles against Britain. Well, certainly in the famine, the lesson that was taught there was a lesson learned in the United States long ago, the lesson learned in so many countries around the world is that ultimately for the British to go, for people to have national freedom, uh, force was the only argument that the British ultimately listened to. So it's legitimate to pour money into the IRA? I don't pour money into the IRA. Uh, Irish Northern Aid gives money to the families of Irish political prisoners. But I understand why there was conflict in 1920 and 1916. Uh, there was conflict in the Fenian times, where there was conflict at the present time because of the nature of British rule. It's a conflict that had been forced upon the Irish people. Senator Edward Kennedy, himself the great grandson of a famine emigrant, was one of the first to extend a welcome to the Sinn Féin leader in the publicity tours of the United States. When the final history is uh, written, uh, there will be the names of many extraordinary men and women who have been a part of this process over many years, trying to move the process of peace forward. Uh, but one of the names that will be there will be the name of Jerry Adams, who has been a, a courageous leader in advancing the cause of, of peace uh, in uh, Northern Ireland. In striving to achieve a just and lasting peace in Northern Ireland, the British government might do well to consider the legacy of its misdeeds in the past. At the time of the famine, it was not so much what the British government did, but what it failed to do, which still rankles with many Irish people. My own feeling is that the British could have done more to help the Irish, and should have done more to help them. But they were hooked on a doctrinaire policy, 
of not interfering with market forces. At the same time, I think it would be a mistake to concentrate too much on that blame, because that could have the effect of deflecting attention from the many lessons which can be extracted from the famine. Some of those lessons have to do with the whole way that the Great Famine is being commemorated in Ireland today. All over the country, local committees are organising events and refurbishing old famine burial grounds. No one is suggesting that there's anything wrong with commemoration as such, but the issues are not always as straightforward as first appears. Part of this is to evoke uh, an image of people in Ireland today uh, as some kind of uh, community of famine victims. But of course, uh, those of us who uh, are around today uh, descend less from the victims than the survivors. And uh, this kind of uh, approach also, I think, uh, risks letting us forget that the famine was also a time when a lot of Irish people were cruel to other p Irish people. Lots of horrible things happened. Uh, neighbour fought against neighbour. Probably some members of uh, a family uh, survived at the expense of other members. These are all aspects which I think are cause for thought uh, and should not be uh, brushed under the carpet uh, in, the, uh, in the commemoration. Uh, the, the, the image evoked is of eight million people, all of whom are somehow equally at risk uh, and uh, equally victims. And uh, history doesn't support that kind of interpretation. The truth is that some of the more successful Catholic farmers were just as anxious as the Protestant landowners to clear their land of unprofitable tenants and make way for cattle or sheep. It's not a random process who survived the famine. As a simple rule, if you had about 20 acres of land, you had a good chance of coming through. If you had less than 20 acres, you had not a very good chance of coming through. So the haves, or those who had a little, survived. The have-nots perished. And that raises certain questions. And those who had sometimes perhaps didn't, didn't share. help, didn't yeah. share. Yeah. Is that possible? It's very possible. We don't know enough about it. But, I mean, what we are told, for example, is that ancient Irish traditions of hospitality, that anyone who came to the door was fed, I mean, that, that they suffered. And you can see why, because it's not even just the food. They might have been bringing fever with them. Uh, so there, there are problems about that, which uh, would have been very difficult for the people of the time. Documents of the period suggest that while some Irish people were generous and self-sacrificing, Others held on to their property and left the poor to die by the roadside. This divide between rich and poor crops up in some of the old myths, like the story from Dulock in County Mayo, where 400 starving people are said to have been swept into the lake and drowned because the wealthy landowners turned them away. The story isn't entirely true, but it's been put to good use. Every year, the Irish charity, AFRI, organises a famine walk along the route the starving people are said to have taken. The purpose of the walk isn't just to remember the poor Irish people who died, but to encourage awareness that millions of poor people in the world today are still suffering the horrors of hunger and despair. What the poor need more than charity is justice. And I suppose what we're trying to do in terms of this great famine project is to ensure that it's not just about looking back at the past uh, and, and just remembering the pain of the past, that if we believe what happened to our people in the past was wrong, then it's equally wrong if it's happening to any other human being, and of course it is. And so I think that we've got to then look at what are our responsibilities as Irish people uh, in relation to the poor and the hungry throughout Asia, Africa and Latin America today. Irish charities like Concern and Trokera were very active in famine relief during the recent tragedy in Somalia. The Irish president, Mary Robinson, was the only Western leader to make a personal visit to see for herself the sufferings of the people and the efforts of Irish charities to relieve them. The president also opened the Irish Famine Museum at Strokestown Park in the summer of 1994. 
As countries grow more prosperous, as they move more confidently towards modern statehood, the temptation is not, despite the accepted wisdom, to dwell on the past, but to try to escape it, to forget its defeat, its sorrow, and the terrible reminder it offers to us all of just how precarious life is. Remembering the suffering President Robinson is patron of the Famine Museum because she believes that it holds important lessons for the Irish people today. Mrs. Robinson also believes that Ireland's own history gives her a sympathetic understanding of the problems faced by poor countries in the modern world. And I think that Ireland does have quite a unique position as a member of the European Union, geographically located in Western Europe, in you know, the Richmond's Club for a lot of the world's perception, and we are a reasonably prosperous country. But our experience has been that of a colony striving for independence and of a country devastated by appalling famine. And that is part of our subconscious. It has been something we've had to, and I believe still have to, fully come to steadfast terms with honour, respect, and grow forward from, and do it in a way that gives us a particular understanding of developing countries. I think we have that. I think that's one of the reasons why so many Irish people, priests, nuns, aid workers, nurses, teachers, work in developing countries and do it in the right way, do it with a commitment to empowering, to helping, to building up the strengths of the communities they work with. We'll send, um, we'll send the one with the yellow cross over to you. I don't think she needs to come in. Can you help? Workers for the Irish charity Concern during the Somali famine mm -hmm. exemplified this approach. Ironically, just as most of the frontline relief during the Irish famine was done by private charities, not government agencies. So it is today in much of the third world. In Don Mullen's words, it's not charity the poor need, but justice. At least 300,000 people died here, most of them children. The charity workers do a heroic job. But when I look at the pictures of starving children today, I can't help feeling that we've learned very little in the last 150 years. <laughs>